welcome into our third session of the class on faith, science, and wisdom. A few review words about the last session. <clears throat> During the last session, I talked about amazing emergence within Western culture and civilization of a movement called pre-Socratics, roughly 6th century BC, which laid down the foundation for philosophy equals science, as opposed to polytheistic religion. So here is the first insurrection of reason against religious belief. So it is a unique happening in our Western culture and civilization. It created movement of before Socrates, pre-Socratics, followed by Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Stoics, and Epicureans, a new tradition which lasted almost 1,000 years before it was cancelled by reintroduction of faith in form of monotheistic Christianity, Muslim movements, modern Protestantism, and up to our today's era. So the conflict of reason and faith is a moving force of Western history. Uh, during pre-Socratics and on, they laid down the foundation of what we know nowadays as scientific foundation, which became reintroduced during the Renaissance and continued and strengthened in the last three, four centuries. We can ask a question, how many people were influenced by these pre-Socratic? I think the answer is very few. The masses of people, I would say over 90%, continued their tradition beliefs. So that the scientific breakthrough, philosophical scientific breakthrough, remained just on the surface, just like the cream on the milk. And never penetrated deeper. We can say this is the case all through the centuries up to this very day. So it is just on the surface, but it has a tremendous influence on shaping of our modern life. At the same time when Greeks introduced philosophy science movement, there were powerful movements in other parts of the world. Very fertile were lands of East, of the East India, China, Japan, and Asia Minor. It is a great debate how much they influence each other, whether there was some influence. Because some of the teachings are rather similar. But we can doubt that there was a direct connection. Maybe it is something within human nature which produces similarity. In the end, civilization goes back into 3000 BC. 
there was a city discovered in 20th century, Mohenjo-Daro, city in Indus Valley, with paved streets, brick houses, drainage system, and running water. Amazing city, as their expression of faith. Similar was Chinese culture, which goes back as far as the Indian culture. There is a difference. Gods do not have central role as it is in Hindu Indian tradition. Philosophies were revered. Ethics plays a very important role. In Chinese tradition, emphasis is on good life and how to act, rather the question of absolute truth. For Greeks, the central question was, what is the stuff out of which universe came into being? In Hindu tradition, the central question is, what is self? What is real at all? So it is a completely different question. And I can say what is amazing, that these cultures of East and West ask questions, but that they never asked what is a question that they were aware of question underlying their activity, but they never ask what is the question. Had they asked this very question about what is the question, probably the whole development would have started a completely new path. But how long did it take before we dare to ask the question, what is the question? What kind of activity goes through our mind which elicit a question? This would be the investigation into ourselves. And in both religious tradition and scientific tradition, as I have discussed in our first class, we have tried to shy away from it. Still in 20th century, there was a big battle, you know, with the question, what are we, what is this consciousness? What is the observer, conscious observer? What goes in the consciousness of the observer who observes atomic events. What is going on in us? And as you see, both religious and scientific tradition shy away from it. Our modern scientific tradition divided the world into primary and secondary qualities. The interests of science were primary qualities. Secondary qualities were subjective, and science can never be subjective. You emote too much. You carry us away from scientific pursuit. I have mentioned that it was in quantum physics where the final breakthrough was made where physicists realized that there is something in the act of observation, that there is the observer. And behind the observer, there is this mysterious consciousness. How to penetrate into consciousness? That still is the question. Consciousness is individually 
distributed. So it means each of us has to work on it in, in order to get into our own consciousness. Probably never discovering what goes into somebody else's consciousness. We have assumptions about it. But the assumptions about our own consciousness must be pretty valid assumptions about consciousness of other people, about consciousness of animals. If you have animals at home, I think you discover that they have their own consciousness. You love your cat, you love your doggy. You talk with them, and they listen, they react, they like what you do, they object if they don't like it. So the consciousness is something distributed in all living creatures. <coughs> <coughs> So let's go, let's go back into our tradition. Our tradition, Western tradition, consists mostly of two basic sources, Greek and Roman. We ask very often question, from which of these traditions did we take more, we Americans? Was it Greek tradition or Roman tradition? Each of these traditions developed unique look at the world. Greeks gave us philosophy, science, search. They gave us arts, literature. Romans gave us engineering. Engineering, Roman law, practicality, practical view of the world, road building, canalization, water, central water supply. So which of these two sources had greater impact on us? I think it was Roman. Romans built roads. It was President Eisenhower who, when he came to Europe, did not care very much about European philosophies or European art, literature. He was impressed by Hitler's system of autobahns, highway system. When he came back to the United States after the end of the Second World War, he became the leader who was building American system of highways. This was his sole great leadership in post-war United States. When I came to San Francisco in 1957, <clears throat> I, when I get, got a job at Bechtel Corporation, I was afraid to mention philosophy, philosophy degree, because I would have been rejected and laughed at. So, I qualified as an engineer. I never studied engineering. But I didn't have mathematics, enough design. And so when I was employed as engineer, they noticed my knowledge of foreign languages. So they liked it. I didn't know at that time what was going on in the world outside of the United States and, and Cold War. Some of you remember 
those who are a little bit older. Uh, then during the 50s, there was a big battle in today's Iran. Iranians nationalized oil industry. They established their independent rule for the first time in their history, a democratic rule of Prime Minister Mossadegh. It was Mossadegh who nationalized oil industry. What does it mean to nationalize oil industry? They touched the interest of British, French, and American. This was the beginning of the great trouble with Iran. Due to close cooperation of intelligence services of United States, British, and French, they managed to remove the first democratic government of President Mossadegh. After that, the country returned back into the rule of Western oil people. At that time, I worked for Bechtel. I was surprised when one day they came to me and asked me if I would like to go to Persia, that I could served there with my knowledge of languages uh, for Bechtel in Persia. I was told that I am working without my knowledge on project of greatest refinery in the world in Abadan. So Bechtel was working at that time before Mossadegh was removed already on project of refinery in Abadan. I was working on it, you know, but I didn't know where it was. This was kept secret. Now then they ask me, would you like to go there? Then I noticed that people around Bechtel were people like Kasper Weinberger, later uh, foreign minister in the Reagan government, and very leading people of American politics who were in charge of Bechtel. Next was the extended hand of Hoover's institution, which was closely connected with this interest. So it opened my eyes. You know. Mossadegh was removed. Bechtel was moving into Persia, Iran. So here is an example you know, how we have produced our today's problems in, in Iran and in the whole area around by removing the first democratic government Persia ever had. So, so far, so far my recollection of, of 50s. <clears throat> now, back a little bit more in, in the history into Roman Empire. At the peak of Roman Empire, which started with Caesar in first century BC, Roman Empire included North Africa, much of Europe, Near East, as far as to the border of Persia, and as you know, Great Britain included. Emperor Augustus ruled the empire till his death at 14 AD. 
with his rule, the empire entered a long period of stability called Pax Romana, Roman peace. The idea of divine ruler was common in the East. Alexander the Great returned from Asia as a divine ruler. And so were the Roman emperors. So was Rome after Caesar. Growth of Rome carried with itself a seed of downfall. They didn't know about it. Very seldom the empires know that they are falling apart. Rome didn't know that. By extension, in all directions, they needed more and more army. Where do you take the army from? From lowest class of people. Rich people never go and fight. People in Wall Street would never go and fight. They are too valuable to sit where they are. Who will go to fight? Or who won't go to fight against ISA? Our people down at the social scale. When they have to fight, these will be the people. In Rome, these were agricultural workers. They were the soldiers which were sent all over this extended empire. <clears throat> Wherever they went, they occupied territories of other people, of other cultures, of other languages, and superimposed Roman rule on all of these nations. Rome needed food. The food was not produced in Italy. Where do you take the food from? From all of these new countries. And you take it and pay for it if you do very little. The reaction is dissatisfaction of the people. So it was cooking under the surface, boiling in the whole empire. Roman emperors didn't know that. During the first century, it was apparent to Roman intelligentsia. But they had not very much to say, because an average Roman was more interested in games, in entertainment. Rome had a slogan, carpe diem, catch this very day, squeeze out of it everything you can. Maybe there won't be tomorrow. So live it up today. Live it up. So th this was belief of an average Roman. People all around the empire were very dissatisfied with Roman rule. They ceased to believe in Roman supremacy. They started rebelling. Most active among them were Jews. Jews were ancient people descended from Semitic tribes in the land of Canaan, the Holy Land, the modern Palestine, and Israel. Some of them were former slaves in Egypt 
rescued by a charismatic leader, Moses, possibly in 15 or 13th century BC. The Exodus was the foundational event of their faith. The story was told of how God, Yahweh, had spoken to Moses at Mount Sinai to follow his way, which is in the document Torah. The core was the Ten Commandments with their religious and social obligations. Hand in hand with that went covenant, agreement with God, foundation of monotheism, of one God. Time had a direction, the world has purpose, and we Jews are nation cl closest to God, God's children. So this was Jewish belief. One question about this great event of Exodus. I think it is a very good story. There is very little historical evidence. You know, Egyptians had excellent system of writing down all events in their history. Event like Exodus would have been noticed by Egyptian historian. It would have shaken the whole economy of Egypt. There is not one single note about Exodus. So as Italian said, sino ne vero e bene travato. If it is not truth, it is very well narrated. <laughs> but it became a foundational religious truth for Jewish people. Nobody ever tried to find any historical document about it. So this is the power of faith. You can fabricate and believe in it. Any criticism is rejected. So this is part, I paid attention to it many years ago, and I had many enemies, you know, and by just telling the story which I elaborated more in detail about Moses, how when he rescued the people of Israel, of the refugees from Egypt, and how everything worked for their favor. The sea opened, they moved, sea closed. And as soon as the people were safe, the people were just people. They started remembering the old faith, the old superstitions. Then I was thinking, what is the role of a leader like Moses? Now he leads the people out of Egypt. And now the people are rebelling against him. And with a little bit of psychology, 
I try to transcend myself into Moses. How would you feel when you rescue the people and now they don't want to listen to you? I felt I would be desperate. So I invented the story that desperate Moses went to Mount Sinai said to hell with you I don't want to see you anymore I am desperate what to do they dug up old gods sitting there and returning to their old beliefs before they came to Egypt Moses in deep despair he was a very inventive man he knew that democracy would have not worked so when Yahweh God appeared in front of him and gave him Ten Commandments. Moses was a very shrewd man. He knew that when he goes back to his people and start telling them, look, how do you like number one? How do you like number two? I am convinced that they would have been sitting there up to now they would have amended Moses and just like our Congress you know <laughs> doing nothing you know <laughs> so Moses was a smart man he took Ten Commandments went to the people and told the people I heard it from above take it or leave it they took it and it became the foundation of the Old Testament and generally accepted. When you look at Ten Commandments critically, you discover that these are ten generalizations similar to all other people over our globe expressing needy social bond. You find similar formulation in all cultures and civilization. Not necessarily in 10, in 12, in 8, but this is what Moses had to figure out. And we know how powerful it was and how powerful it is still up to this very day. Uh, yeah. I recall hearing a reading somewhere that uh, the basic story of Moses itself was scripted from the Babylonian Jewish people. Yeah, you know, there are so many stories, yeah. so, so many stories, you know, and there is very little documentation, you know. It is 15 until 13 centuries BC, so it is difficult to take it or leave it, you know. And but it comes down to the essence, it's, it's, it was an inventive decision. Yeah. You know, Egyptians were far higher standing culturally and civilizationally, you know, than, than Jews. Uh, Jewish people were nomadic people. So nothing in comparison with highly developed civilization and culture of Egypt. <clears throat> but they were very tough people and they got organized around their old 
Testament, very proud people, and very intelligent people. They survived tough time being persecuted by enemies all around. Surviving 20th century, the greatest persecution of Jewish people. So one has to admire the, the culture and their toughness. <clears throat> so Roman Empire was falling apart, not knowing it. By the time of Jesus, Rome ruled land called Palestine. In Palestine, prophets predicted the age of blessings coming of Messiah, liberator of people of Israel. <clears throat> it was a well-organized, holy resistance movement taking up very often arms. Are you familiar with Masada? And there were many cases like this. So yeah, Jews are courageous people, and when they are convinced, they are willing to fight. And they fought Roman Empire. Jesus was a wandering, charismatic teacher and healer who drew crowds. Many hoped that he was one of the messiahs. He said, kingdom of God is within you. He was a real man. In history, who was executed when Tiberius was the emperor and Pontius Pilate was Roman prefect of Judea. Twelve apostles distributed the gospel of Jesus, which spread rapidly throughout the Roman Empire. Legend tells us that Peter ended up in Rome, Mark in Egypt, and Thomas in India. Jewish council in Israel in 84 AD rejected Christianity as a valid form of Judaism. So Christianity was excluded by Jews from the state of Israel, from the Palestine. What year was that again? Hmm? What, what year? 84. 84 AD. Constantine, Roman emperor, legalized Christianity in the year 318 A.D. with his famous Edict of Milan and moved the capital from Rome to eastern city he called by his name Constantinople. Now they Istanbul, Turkish city. Under Theodosius, the Christianity was established religion permeated Western and Eastern culture. Rome fell in the West to advancing Germans in the year 410 
410 AD, Roman, Rome ceased to be the center of Roman Empire. Emperors continue their role in the East until 1453, 1453, when they were defeated by Turks. After occupation of Constantinople, scientists, artists, philosophers escaped, and theologians escaped from defeated Constantinople in two directions, to the west, mostly into Venice, from Venice into Italy, Florence, and other cities. The other branch and the leadership of theologians went to Moscow. <coughs> Moscow thus became the third Rome. Rome, Constantinople, Moscow. Moscow became the center of East Orthodox Church. Before Kiev Empire, accepted Eastern Christianity from Constantinople. In the meantime, they moved to Moscow, and Moscow became, after Constantinople, the chief city of Orthodox Church. In the West, after fall of Rome to Vandals and to invaders from the north, the major role was played by a Roman Pope. He established a new leadership for defeated Rome. And the Pope's the leadership survived. It was called Papo Caesarism, Pope ruling the state and deciding all important events. Very rapidly, the rule of Christianity, Western and Eastern, occupied the great part of former Roman Empire. Various teachings became detrimental detrimental to Western tradition of learning. With the fall uh, under Justinian in 5th century AD, it is said this is the end, final end of antiquity. He closed the academy in Athens and he closed any continuation of Olympic Games. These two events mean the end of antiquity. Out of that came new emphasis on lack of learning. Less you know, faster you get into heaven of God. It went so far that emperors didn't know how to read and write because they wanted to get into heaven. Under Charlemagne, Charles the Great, it came so far that he himself was illiterate. But, but he recognized that it cannot go farther. He invited a learned monk from England who came and established new foundation of learning 
and the foundation consists of four disciplines of Pythagoras and three disciplines of sophist, thus laying down the foundation for seven liberal arts, which is the foundation of Western University, which six, seven centuries later was expressed through four faculties. Out of the seven liberal arts became four faculties which is standard division of continental university. Continental university has to have faculty of philosophy, faculty of law, faculty of theology, and faculty of medicine. So in order to be true university, University comprises these four faculties, philosophy, law, medicine, and theology. By 14th century, new universities are organized. And at that time, there are only very few universities like Oxford and Cambridge and new, new universities are established in Prague, Charles University in 1348, University of Paris, later University of Heidelberg. By 14th, 15th century, we have a new type of education, which is becoming very dangerous for organized faith. One shouldn't be surprised to find a reform movement which originated in England. Under Oxford theologian Wycliffe, Wycliffe. It was he who inspired pupils to look critically at the leadership of Roman Pope. He was far from Rome. Of course, he was disliked by theologians, Roman theologians. And after he died, his bones were dug up, and he was burned at a stake. There was a man, my former count countryman, in 14th century, Jan Hus, John Hus, who took the teaching of Wycliffe and took it seriously and organized the first resistance, theological resistance against Rome. The Rome didn't know what to do. They invited him to Constance and assured him with all rights and it was certified by emperor himself. So he trusted them and went to Constance to defend his teaching. He was arrested and sentenced by Constance Council to die at a stake, which happened at the beginning of 15th century. As a, re a result of his death, Bohemian rebellion started and expressed itself in Hussite rebellion. Against this, Rome sent crusaders to defeat it. They did not defeat Hussite movement. Hussite movement 
was liquidated from within by internal disagreements. What to do with the first freedom they have not depending on Rome. So they crashed and were controlled, you know, by Rome again. After defeat of Hussite movement, we have other movements which have arisen. And After Jan Hus, we have movement of Martin Luther in Germany, 1483 to 1546. Other movement by John Calvin, Calvin, 1509 until 1564 and Swiss reformer Ulrich Zwingli, 1484-1531, Swiss movement. Lothar Zwingli. Calvin. They became founders of Protestant movement, which became very powerful in Northern and Central Europe. It became very powerful in England through England in all British colonies. So now we have a split Christianity as a powerful movement. So, um, so the Protestant, Protestantism <coughs> arose in resistance to the Roman Church. So the Eastern Orthodox, did they remain upon the old church? Yes. They maintained the old tradition of Constantinople. Yes, but they had no reform. No, no reform. Okay. Only the reform was very difficult to introduce, you know. Roman Catholic Church was very powerful and suppressed any attempt, yeah, like in Bohemia, you know, against Jan Hus. But in Germany, it was different because uh, Luther, was very diplomatic and he knew how to play it with the middle class, you know, politically. He was very smart. So he survived. But he was at the beginning, he had almost no chance either. So was Zwingli and Calvin. Okay. But they created great following just like Jesus. So would you Entertain the notion that in place of a reform, you know, because we all know about the abuses of the church, and why they had to be reformed in the first moment. And since the East didn't reform, is it possible that the rise of communism itself was a reform? The, the reformation of the soil? You know, communism became as orthodox mm -hmm. as orthodox church. That there is nothing in between. You know, it creates human mind. Stalin was student of theology, orthodox theology until he was 16 years old. Then he discovered Karl Marx. He memorized Karl Marx just like he did memorize the Bible. And now he, was, he had a new leader, new messiah. Most of the leaders of uh, communist movement 
I would say, with the exception of Trotsky. He did not have open mind. They had no tradition of democracy. Russia never had democracy in their entire Russian tradition. There was orthodox religions with orthodox way of thinking, one replaced by Soviet Marxist way of thinking. Marx himself warned all of his followers that it would be disastrous if his teaching gets into Russia. Marx himself. He did not expect that his teaching could start from Russia and be exported from Russia. But I yeah. to think this, uh, this sort of a new paradigm of well, that, that in a way, Marxism itself sort of carried forth the, uh, uh, some, some concepts of early Christianity in the phrase, from each according to his need, and uh, no, from each according to his ability and to each according to his needs. Yeah. Which is a very Christian concept. Yes, yeah. And and, and you might say that's the ultimate expression of of uh, Christian generosity. And you might say communalism, communism. Yeah. But but then it gets distorted. I mean, Marx gets demonized. Yeah. So the so the Catholic Church is among the most uh, has declared communism to be its greatest enemy. No, no. You know, there <laughs> there is one uh, one aspect. In modern communism, the, le the, the leaders were of Jewish origin. Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, both of them were Jewish. Karl Marx became a new messiah for masses of people with his work Das Kapital. Yeah. It became a new form of testament, belief for common men all over the world. So he became a messiah, and thus uncritical. In his, in his age, you know, he was product of revolutionary year 1848, when he produced his teaching. He wrote Communist Manifesto. Communist Manifesto was an organizing document for revolution 1848. This was young Marx. This was the fiery young Marx. After defeat of the revolution, he escaped into a country which was very generous in modern history, England. There were refugees from all over the world after the revolution in 1848 who were able to reside in London. They hated British way of life because they hated democracy. They didn't know what to do you know, with British workers. British workers were not like sheep, you know, to be organized. You know, what was the case in dictatorial states? <coughs> Karl Marx himself was involved in discussions in taverns. You know, he lived like a, a bohemian, bohemian, you know, in taverns, married German aristocratic lady, not making any money, and drinking with his buddies and preparing world revolution. Discussing British workers and criticizing them, that they are not real workers. They don't stand up and fight against their masters. You know, British had one revolution in 17th century. And they didn't want to, they learned from that revolution. They didn't want to have any other one. I thought, 
British develop democracy, democratic way of thinking. It's not about that. I just want you to know where in the spectrum of the Christian religions does the Ethiopian Christianity belong and the Egyptian one? Yeah, Ethiopian Christianity uh, accepted Christianity, you know, from uh, uh, Jesus' movement. It was brought in, but... but they were considered Catholic. No, there, there were elements the, of traditional way of thinking, borrowing from Egyptians. <coughs> and it kind of amalgamed into the movement of e Ethiopian Christianity. They had connection with cr Christians, but it, was, it is a unique type of Christianity. And, but back to, to England. England produced a modern citizen who based his thinking on Magna Carta, on democratic tradition, connected philosophically with empiricism, which was closer to new type of democracy and social democracy. They developed movement among workers, Fabian, socialism. It drove Karl Marx crazy when he heard, you know, that there is Fabian socialism. Fabian socialism was named after General Fabius Maximus, <coughs> Roman emperor who is famous for having had never won a war. He always retreated. When Hannibal was going to strike, you know, he sneaked away. Hannibal went into empty spaces, and there was no fa Fabius. So the British intellectuals, like Bernard Shaw and A.G. Wells and others in the second half of 19th century, contemporaries of Karl Marx, produce the movement of Fabian Socialism after the name of Fabius Maximus. So British Socialists fight in the parliament. Of course, you have to have a parliament. Karl Marx didn't have a parliament in Germany. And his movement without parliament could not win any country. Britishers had parliament, and the party, Labour Party, was fighting in the parliament. When there was majority against them, they retreated and prepared to start all over again. So they reduced number of hours for average worker from 14 to 12. What a great victory and prepared to start fighting again. For Karl Marx, it was movement he could not stomach. He wanted to have a revolutionary who overthrows everything, creates mess everywhere. You know. This was Karl Marx. At the end of his life, he had to realize that his teaching, that economy produces new society, and that there is no influence of other parts of society, like politics, religion, on mind of man. He believed in economic laws. Economy is God. And this economy will create new society. At the end of his life, he had to admit that his formula, economy is God, producing the, the whole content of society, is mistaken. This was the beginning of new teaching in sociology in Western Europe. And 
United States. So what Marxian formula is the old formula, God creates A plus B plus C plus D plus everything else in human society. God is, in religion, producer of everything of his products. Marx replaces this formula, God, with economy. So economy produces everything else. After 30 years of life in Great Britain, Karl Marx became an old man. And he decided to accept the formula where E, A, B, C, D, and so on. Each of these individual religion, for instance, in other words, everything influences everything else. This is our today's view. Yes, this is the end of Marxism, which he introduced. This was the beginning of social democracy, which became a powerful movement on the continent, which took this form that it is not economy, but everything else in human society produces content of human society. So the old Karl Marx went against young Karl Marx. When did Marx Yeah, Marx died. After him, it was social democracy which became the leading. What year? What year was Marx He died 1883. And after his death, uh, Friedrich Engels, his alter ego, he died about 14 years later. He was influential in disseminating the ideas of old Marx. It became evident that in order to do something, change the society, Socially, you have to become a political party. In order to become a political party, you need a parliament. In Russia, there never was a parliament. I, I was just thinking, going back to your last idea, uh, to what extent Marx saw the uh, abuses of the Industrial Revolution. And I guess that's what the Fabians. Yeah, no. So it's ironic that he saw that the, uh, the economy was all, all important and treated all the well but also all the <coughs> abuses and maldistribution of wealth. You know, the working classes got more impoverished than the upper classes got more, yeah. which we see continuing today. Yeah, uh, you know, he lived in England. He learned the impact of industrial revolution. At that time, England was the classical country of capitalism. So he studied his capitalism with German mind, without parliament, the effect, effect of British capitalism, seen his European dogmatic eyes. And this is when he came as a young refugee. He never changed until when he was old. You know, he saw that his movement is not going to work. The Fabians became very popular and successful. They reduced working hours for males from 14 to 10 hours to 9 hours, starting with 8 hours. Women did not work 14 hours, only 10 hours and less. Children did not have to work. Marx had to see this progress without revolution. 
he saw it at the end of his life. So he was a deeply disappointed man. He had to capitulate. And he was a very unhappy man. His children were dying of tuberculosis. His wife was dying. His comrades from all over the world were dying. They became old after 30, 40 years having had lived in England. Under Soviet era, there was a monument, big bust of Karl Marx erected at the place of his grave in Highgate. And bust. No, it is just a big head. Yeah. I, I stood in front of it. I thought there was a part of body too. And there were, there were all revolutionaries from Iran, from Iraq, from Middle East, from Japan, from China, who died, they were buried ar around Karl Marx. In Highgate, if you get to, to London, go, go to see his grave. This was Stalin's gift <coughs> to British Fabian workers. So all old revolutionaries are buried around Karl Marx. It is a, in a way sad movement of a fanatic, of a man who believed that he was a messiah. Man who never worked in his life. He got a job in British Museum, but he was fired because his writing was not legible. I went to British Museum one day. I was sitting in his chair and thinking about him. As a matter of fact, I traveled all around London to see all dwellings where he resided with his family. And Karl Marx came home very often on Sunday morning, drunk, and slept on a bed in the middle of the living room and his children were getting up and the mother cautioned them, saying, Papa schläft, the father sleeps. Poor father was drunk. Thus he was preparing for other revolutionary deed. It is a sad story of a man who died in London. But he created a great movement, picked up by Lenin, who came from a country without a parliament. He could not start the movement of Karl Marx, of the old Karl Marx. He could not start there because there was no parliament in Russia. So Lenin took the teaching of young Karl Marx from around 1848 and turned this teaching into new religion. It is Lenin who famously said, religion is opium of mankind. And I add to it. And then he whispered, I give you a more powerful opium. <laughs> and so he did with Stalin and with Mao Zedong. And they created a very powerful movement which had shaken the foundation of the whole world in the 20th century. Before any prediction on our side, the great empire of Soviets collapsed in 1889. <coughs> it looks like it's dead now. 
but some people feel that there is a new Russian emperor, Putin, who is trying to reconstruct the empire, Soviet empire. So we will see in years to come.